there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. We're here today at the Paradise Comics Convention to watch as two serious comic book collectors duke it out superhero style for a chance of winning an amazing prize. Now we're not telling them what that prize is going to be until the very end, but only one can win. I collect comic books because they're worth collecting. Amazing Fantasy, $15, $6,200, $7,500, $19,000. I absolutely don't collect comics for their value. I'm dressed to impress. A real fan would have worn the mask. Uh, I could take a beating from the Hulk. What kind of pressure is that? This kind of looks like a three-year-old did it. <laughs> Brains is what gets you places. Super Canary. Beppo the Super Monkey. How would you know that? This is the best day of my life. I may cry. Are you ready? May the best man win. Good luck. On Collector Showdown, there are two challenges. First, a test of knowledge. Second, a test of skill. If our competitors are tied after the first two rounds, we go to a sudden death showdown. The stakes are high and the winner takes all. The prize will be a real dream come true for only one of our two collectors. Will it be Mike, the 21-year-old Marvel Comics collector? Or Don, the 39-year-old, more seasoned DC Comics collector? You're just gonna have to watch and find out. Lately, the comic book world has begun to look a lot like the stock market, as the value of vintage comics continues to rise alongside pop culture's embrace of comic book characters through movies and TV. For example, the most valuable comic is Action Comics No. 1, the first Superman comic book from 1938. A copy in mint condition is worth a half a million dollars. Most collectors are now part investor and part dreamer. And the world they inhabit is ruled by the big two publishers. DC Comics, who created the superhero mold with characters like Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman. And Marvel Comics, famous for its more complex superheroes like Spider-Man, the X-Men, and the Hulk. So what determines the value of a comic book? There are three main criteria. Rarity, the condition, and popularity. This is Action 33, and it's worth about four or $500. Hulk 181, the first full appearance of Wolverine. Uh, and we're selling this one for $1,200. First appearance of the new X-Men. Tips of scales at about $1,000. My most expensive book, Journey into Mystery, which is the first appearance of Thor. Retail price, $19,000. What? To say comic books hold their value is a bit of an understatement. This amazing Spider-Man number one is worth $24,000. Oh, yeah. Well, my name's Michael. I've been collecting comic books. Uh, for uh, as long as I can remember. I'm 21 years old. I have about four to 5,000 comic books myself, um, and uh, I collect action figures and movie posters. I have a lot of them. I collect comic books because they're worth collecting. They're valuable, they're cool, and I love them. My name is Don. I've been collecting comics for 34 years. I have 19 long boxes full. That would be about over 4,000 individual comic books. The main motivation I have for buying comic books is that they are so valuable. I absolutely don't collect comics for their value. In fact, I'm offended that somebody would actually enter the hobby as a speculator. I buy five times more comic books than I read. I like a comic that's been read, that I know that has been read, has a little crease in the spine. The spine's been broken a little bit because you know it's been enjoyed. It's all about knowledge, and the more people know about comic books, the more they're gonna be worth definitely worth something to me. Oh yeah. This is money right here. First black costume, Spider-Man. Right there, that's awesome. Then the uh, the two costumes fighting for control. Yeah, awesome Spider-Man comic right there. Uh, my favorite character is, uh, is Wolverine. Almost tied with Spider-Man. I am a very big Superman fan. I mean, what's not to like about Big Blue? He is the iconic superhero. He's the man. And my mother knew that going in, 
and for months she struggled to knit me this sweater and gave it to me for my birthday. And I've had it seemingly forever. It's one of the most treasured things that I own. I'm a Marvel guy. Um, you know, I love Marvel comics. I prefer Marvel just because I find the characters to be more human. Spider-Man, he's just a guy, you know. I mean, he may have superpowers, but he's a guy that's struggling with life. You know, um, same with Wolverine. In DC, they're all super and just far too super in my opinion. I'm a DC guy all the way. DC gives me the escapism that I'm looking for. Marvel Comics, too dark. I've got my own problems. I don't need somebody else's. I think my passion for comic books really ignited in a, around 1980 when I came across a book called The New Teen Titans, written by Marv Wolfman and uh, co-written and drawn by George Perez. That set me off on a tangent that has cost me thousands and thousands of dollars, heartache, and uh, a whole lot of time. This is my most prized comic. The New Teen Titans, this is the issue that started it for me. There's one comic book that I have always wanted and that I still want. More than anything in this world, I want this comic book so badly. Wolverine, Wolverine's first appearance. I want to own Hulk 181. And uh, frankly, I'm a university student and I can't afford it right now. It's uh, about $750 if you want it in good condition. But uh, when I own that comic book, my heart will be content. Well, not only do I hope to win the competition, and I feel pretty confident that uh, that's going to happen, what I really, really want, and what I've been looking forward to for months, is meeting George Perez and getting him to sign issue number one of Crisis on Infinite Earths and the hardbound copy, and maybe even throw in a little sketch. And if I'm really lucky, I'll get him to sign my Titans number one. You know, I've always been a real serious collector, and I want to know if I'm as serious as I think I am. Mike, I've been collecting comics longer than you've been alive. If you think you've got the stones to measure up, bring it on. I would say to my challenger that he better study up because uh, I'm pretty sure I know what I'm talking about. So this is the first time our contestants are actually gonna meet each other. Mike, Don, Don, Mike. A real fan would've worn the mask. Ooh. Well, I hope you came prepared because uh, I'm dressed to impress. I'm gonna ask nine questions of each of you separately. And when I ask those questions, whoever I'm not asking those questions to, you must leave out of earshot. What comic marked the first appearance of the amazing Spider-Man? Amazing Fantasy 16. Amazing Fantasy number 15. Don, you got that one right. Stan Lee, the man who created many of Marvel's great characters, couldn't convince his boss that a teenage science geek with the powers of a spider was heroic enough to have his own comic book. So he stuck Spider-Man in Amazing Fantasy number 15, the last issue of a title that was being cancelled. Sales went through the roof and Spider-Man got his very own magazine. Which of Wonder Woman's accessories allows her to breathe in outer space? Wow, breathe in outer space. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I'm going to say that it is her tiara. Her magic tiara. Right, so now I can understand why neither of you got it right because it's an accessory that's hidden behind her wonderful dark hair, her earrings. That provides her with oxygen, Damn. lets her breathe in outer space. Sorry, neither of you got that one. How would you know that? In what title did the Silver Age Flash and Green Lantern first appear? Oh man, I'm totally clueless on this one. It is Showcase Comics and it is... Uh... All we need is the title, okay. that's good. All-Star Squadron. I'm just going to throw that out there. I don't know it. Mike, you said All-Star Squadron. Don, Showcase Comics. Mike, sorry, you got that one wrong. Don, right on. It was Showcase Comics. The 1930s and 40s are known as the Golden Age of Comics. That's when many superheroes were first introduced. 
The 1960s are known as the Silver Age of Comics, a time when many of the Golden Age characters like Green Lantern and Flash were revamped for a new audience. What is Captain America's real name? Steve Rogers. Steve Rogers. You guys both got this one right. Steve Rogers was too sickly and frail to join the military in 1941, but wanted to serve so badly he agreed to take part in a secret military experiment. So they injected him with a dose of the super soldier serum and transformed him into Captain America, the most prominent patriotic hero of World War II. What are the names of Superman's biological parents? It's Martha. Martha and... Uh... Biological parents. Oh! Jor-El and Lara. Jor-El. Jor-El. Jor-El and, and, and Shar-El. Shir Mike, I'm sorry to say, you did not get that right. You answered Jor-El and shir -El. Don, you got that one right. Jor-El and Lara. Jor-El, of course, was the scientist, wow. the man's father. Name Superman's four super pets. His four super pets? Mm -hmm. Well, it's Crypto. Uh, there was Beppo the super monkey, Crypto. Crypto, the amazing super cat. They call it the super horse because he's, they're all part of the same family. Super canary. And uh, Streaky the cat. And uh, super fish. Mike, you answered Crypto, Amazing Super Cat, Amazing Canary, and Amazing Fish. <laughs> Sorry. I'd like the Amazing Doesn't Fish. Doesn't cut it. Uh. Don, this is where you got another one right. Woo! Beppo, Crypto, Streaky, and Comet. Nice. Of course, Beppo, Monkey, Crypto, the Dog, Streaky, the Cat, and Comet, the Horse, and, you know, they all joined forces and became the Legion of Super, super pets. pets at one point. Absolutely. So, okay. Edwin Jarvis serves as the butler to what super team? I know this. This is the Avengers. The Avengers. A tie. You both got it right. <laughs> the Avengers. Nice. Yes. Who were the five original X-Men characters? I don't want their real names. Their okay. character names. Marvel. Cyclops, Professor Xavier, Angel, Beast, Iceman, Marvel Girl, Nightcrawler. Oh boy. And Cyclops. Um. No, I'm blanking on that one. Mike, you got it. Nice. Done. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So the answer is Cyclops, Marvel Girl, Iceman, Angel, and the Beast. The original X-Men first appeared in 1963, but it wasn't until the team was reintroduced with a new international membership in 1975 that it became the most popular title in comics. Now this is the last question. What was the first Marvel DC comic book crossover. I'm, I'm going to take a guess. It's saying maybe Avengers versus the JLA. The very first uh, Superman, Spider-Man treasury, I believe it was 76, and they met, they met in New York City. There was some journalism convention. It was a bit of a trick question, and neither of you got oh, it right. Oh, you're kidding. What was the first Marvel DC comic book crossover? If I had to ask what was the first superhero crossover, Don, you would have got that right. That was Superman versus the Amazing Spider-Man. But in fact, the answer was The Wizard of Oz. They actually teamed really? together in 1975, one year before really? Spider-Man versus Superman came out. Damn. And The Wizard of Oz is that answer. So the final tally is Don six, Mike three. Don, <laughs> if yes. you win in the next round, you, that's it, game over, done. Winner right. takes all. That's it, round two of Collector Showdown next.
I've always had a lot of confidence in myself. What kind of pressure is that? So I think I can do this. I'm lucky I was able to get pen to paper and not throw up on it. In round one of Collector Showdown, Don defeated Mike in a test of knowledge. And now it's time for round two, test of skill. All right, it's time for the second showdown challenge. I'm gonna give each of you these sets of markers and I want you to draw a superhero, any superhero. Now, Don, you remember you won the first round, so if you win this, All right. you get the prize. I'm ready. Mike, you can still make up for it. If you win this, we go to a tiebreaker. How do you guys feel about your artistic abilities? Anxious, but scared to death. Why? I have zero artistic ability. Mike, what about you? You know what? Everyone who knows me tells me I'm a terrible artist, but I've always had a lot of confidence in myself, so I think I can do this. I think I'm gonna rock this competition. All right, but I have to tell you both, I'm no artist. So we have an expert artist coming in to judge your drawings. We have George Perez here, who is wow. going to be our <laughs> expert master. artist. Oh, I'll tell you this. I am a huge fan, Mr. Perez. George Perez, a celebrated comic book illustrator, has drawn both DC and Marvel comic books for 30 years. In fact, when the rival companies faced off their all-star super teams, the Avengers and the Justice League, George Perez plotted and drew it. He's perhaps best known for drawing DC's groundbreaking miniseries, Crisis on Infinite Earths. Oh, and by the way, George Perez just happens to be Don's hero. So come on in here. These guys have three minutes to Ooh, do their challenge. Yeah. Are you set? Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you nervous? Yeah. Okay. And go. He actually managed to uh, do all the telltale uh, characteristics, the claw sign, of course, the X uh, from, from, it, from the X-Men. So easily identifiable. One of the things that both of you guys did was make sure that you did the uh, recognizable emblems. Of <laughs> Superman, the man of steam here. Yes. Um, okay, and of course, the, the insignia, which thank you. Otherwise, I, I would be guessing without color. Thank you. Um, and, so, and, I'm, and I have to confess, I know you're a fan, but I think <laughs> the edge will go to you. All no right. way. Yes. No way. Yes. 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 The edge goes to you. We're going to the round, last round. I'm ready. Sudden I'm death. ready. Bring it on. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm ready. It's tiebreaker. Okay. Tiebreaker. All righty then. Thank you, George. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Love this man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. I can't draw. I've got three minutes to not draw and then I'm not drawing in front of George freaking Perez. What kind of pressure is that? He's my hero. I'm lucky I was able to get pen to paper and not throw up on it. I've got so much confidence right now that uh, I, could, I could leap tall buildings, I could, uh, I could take a beating from the Hulk, and you know what? So uh, no matter what happens in the next round, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in confident and I'm gonna come out happy. All right, before we go to a tiebreaker, why don't you guys take a look at each other's drawings? <laughs> this will be fun. Oh, man. Oh. Not even close. <laughs> what? Mine's bad? Mine's, yours looks like a... Yours is great. What? Mine's great? Well, that's really... Uh, thank you. I'm really complimented. Because your, yours kind of looks like a three-year-old did it. So. <laughs> oh! Yeah, no, that's about right. But a three-year-old Don. Are you going to take that? That's okay. Brains is what gets you places, and we saw what happened earlier. Yeah, and he has the brains, but uh, apparently I got the brawn, so uh, let's go into the last round. May the best man win. Good, Good luck. luck. In the Sudden Death Showdown, our contestants will have to correctly identify a series of comic book characters. If they both identify the character correctly, we continue. If they both identify the character incorrectly, we continue. 
The first contestant to give the correct answer when the other one does not wins the game and gets to claim our fabulous mystery prize. This is the tiebreaker. This is what it all comes down to. Now to make this fair, I've got pictures in my hand of superheroes who are not from DC Comics and they're not from Marvel Comics. All right? Are you guys ready? Ready. Ready. Go. Spawn. Spawn. Okay, right. Hellboy. Hellboy. You're both right. Don, I need to know the name of the character. Okay, Don, you said Leonardo, you said Michelangelo. And the actual answer is Michelangelo. Mike, you are the winner. No way. Wow. You won no. this collector show. No now. way. It was Michelangelo. Damn. That was my favorite Ninja Turtle. Yes. Don, yes. I'm sorry. I am so excited. If I had a turtle, I'd be flushing it down the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, man. No, Good thank one. you. Thank you for competing with Congratulations. me. Congratulations. Yes, I can't believe I won. So you both did really well today. It was a really tough showdown. And Mike, before I tell you what you won, Don, George didn't want you to go away empty-handed. Hi. I Congratulations to you. And, you know, I'm honored way. just to be here with oh, you. But I, I want to hand you this. Oh, as are you your kidding me? Consolation prize. I forgot, I try Superman. Oh my God, I don't even know what to say. I think I'm a, I, I may cry. Oh, no. I may cry. Thank you. I, You're quite welcome. I will treasure this forever. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Holy crap. Don, you didn't win. No. But you've got this grin on your face. Well, apparently what? this is the consolation prize. <laughs> this is this is a sketch drawn by George Perez today and given to me saying to Don still a winner and and it's Superman who's the man. It's like the hand of God has come down and given me this. And, and it's an original. And it's an original and nobody is ever going to have this and it's mine and it says it's mine and I am so moved by this whole entire thing. I I'm, I'm, I guess I'm disappointed not to have won first prize, but I got to tell you Wow, this is first prize for me. Mike, now it's time to find out what you won. Are you ready? No, I'm not ready. You know, I, I need my friend here for moral support. This is my best friend. He came all the way down with me from Peterborough, from university. I might be ready now. Blaine, are you ready? I, yeah, I think we are. Okay. <laughs> here we go. This is the prize. $1,000 and 10 minutes to spend it. Whatever you don't spend in 10 minutes, you have to give back to us. You ready? Ten minutes to spend it. Hulk 181. Do you have it? Hulk 181. Hulk 181. How much? For twelve hundred dollars. First appearance of Wolverine. How much? Then I have another one here for one thousand. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm gonna buy Wolverine's first appearance. Okay, hold that for me, okay? Hulk 181. Do you have it? No. Do you have Hulk 181? No, okay. Hulk 181. Yeah. How much? 740. Which one? 740? One, two. At 740? Mm -hmm. My comic book is mine. Mm -hmm. Oh my. God. Sir. No, thank you. You're my buddy, okay? You're my buddy. buddy? I want something. Uh, I got like uh, 240 left. 240? No, two, still 260. I have the one after it. 182. How much is that? 40 bucks. 40 bucks, done. Okay. Here is 20. 20? Done. Okay. We're short on time. There it is. 60 bucks. First appearance black cat. Okay, I'll take that team tight. Five minutes. Too. Okay, and that's 20. So that's 80. Okay, there's there 80. There we go. Thank you very much. Here, 20 bucks back. Discount. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Alrighty. $120. $120. Uh, do you have Hulk 180? Uh, no? You don't have Hulk 180, do you? No. 180, the one before that. Okay, no. I just yep. picked up 180 one. Uh, no? Hulk 180, Hulk 180. Three minutes 
left. No, he doesn't have it. I'm gonna move on. Something cool, something cool, something cool. Something cool, something cool, something cool. Excuse me. Sorry, I'm on a time limit. Can you help me? I don't even know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something X-Men, something. X-Men. Okay, how much is a giant size X-Men, just for a joke? 125. 125? Oh my God, I'll take it. <laughs> 125, there's, yes. there's one. Oh my God, I own this comic. Oh my God. Okay, I got $15 left. $15 in one minute? I can do this. I can do this. That Wolverine right there, how much is that? It's $8. $8, I'll take that. 30 and seconds, Mike. How much are you looking for? This one right here, I'll take that. All right. Okay, how much is that right now? It's uh, $11. You need a yellow dot book. How much is that? Eight seconds. If you don't get That's the money exchange. That's 15 Thank you. Okay. Holy shit. You're done. You're done. <laughs> Oh my god, this is the best day of my life. <gasps> Come here. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're happy. Oh my god, I got Silver Surfer. I love Silver Surfer. This is a comic book that I was hoping to pick up today. Uh, I, I got it. <gasps> Planet Hulk, which is apparently a really cool comic. I, I was thinking about getting it. I, I, I got it. I, I own the first. First Giants has X-Men. It's the first appearance of You'll be okay. Wolverine in an X-Men comic. You'll be okay. You don't understand. <laughs> this is the first appearance of Black Cat. First appearance of Black Cat, New Teen Titans I got, the first first appearance of that. You know what? What if Spider-Man? What if Spider-Man? Join. Here it is. He's here, the world's first and greatest Canadian superhero. <laughs> we are here at the Toronto Aerospace Museum where two World War II aviation buffs and model plane collectors are gonna go head to head for a chance of winning an amazing prize. But we're not telling them what that prize is until the very end. Ta -da. I don't care about women, I care about models. Do we have that on camera? <laughs> Trees, Tiger Moth. Oh, I'll bet Harvey got this one. See, I told you. This is not very good looking, though. <laughs> you think you're gonna win? I'm gonna win. I have you now, Boynton. So buckle up your ejection seats and let's rumble. On Collector Showdown, there are two challenges. First, a test of knowledge. Second, a test of skill. If our contestants are tied after the first two rounds, we go to a sudden death showdown. The stakes are high and the winner takes all. The prize will be a dream come true for only one of these two collectors. Will it be Harvey, a specialist in World War II Japanese aviation? Or will it be Tony with his keen interest in American, Russian and German aviation? Collecting, constructing, and flying model aircraft is a hobby that first took flight in the 1930s, but did not become popular until the 1950s. In the 1950s, you had a monogram enough for big American companies come along and, and make these model kits that were really toys. The guys who played with these toys when they were kids essentially kept with it, and they demanded more accurate representations. It is possible to purchase aircraft models as fully finished products, but serious collectors buy kits that require construction, including painting, gluing, and the application of decals. Plastic scale model aircraft kits usually come in standard scales such as 172nd, 148th, and 132nd. This scale indicates the relationship between the size of the model and the size of the actual aircraft. While any type of collectible can attract prospectors, model aircraft collectors are not as likely to be in it for the money. Now, most collectors, as soon as they find out that a new model has come out of an existing model that was released, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, ditch the old model. It's not worth anything to them. They want the new one because it's more accurate. Every plane has a story to tell, like this tiger moth here, for example. Thousands and thousands of Commonwealth pilots trained in these babies during World War II. And it's the history of these planes that is a big part of the appeal for model plane collectors. And apparently the hours upon hours they spent hunched over their workbench putting the little pieces of the model planes together. 
My name's Harvey, and I've been building models and collecting World War II military aviation for about 30 years now. I have probably around four or 500 unbuilt model kits. My name is Tony, and I've been building models and collecting them since I was about six years old. I have about, I'd say, at least 150 odd unfinished model airplanes. Um, of the model airplanes that I've finished, I have about maybe 20 of them, 25 of them. It takes me about six months to build one. Ta-da! The focus on the collecting here is World War II. It's, that's the theme. And I focus mostly on Japanese aircraft of the Pacific War. It doesn't really fly that way. But... I, I typically like the single engine fighters. Um, I'll build any nation. I like the German ones. I like the Russian ones. Most of my collection would probably be American, just because they tend to be the more colorful examples. They're more fun to build, more interesting to look at. I like the uh, colors and markings of Japanese aircraft. That's one thing that's always fascinated me since I was a kid. World War II aircraft interest me because of the, of the colorful paint schemes. There's just so many different types. There's the plain blue ones, there's the yellow and black checkered ones, there's you know Russian ones with red stars. And of course, there's also sort of the drama of, of the whole conflict, you know, that the heroism and the sacrifice of the individuals is something that's always interested me. Uh, I have you now, point on... As a modeler, I tend to focus on a certain size of model building, and that would be 172nd. Those are the smaller model airplanes. And there's a lot more challenges in detailing cockpits and uh, aircraft details. The smaller it is, the cockpit's smaller. So you have a little less room to work with, and uh, your patience and equipment really is tested to the limit. I don't care about women, I care about models. <laughs> well, my favorite scale is 148 scale, which means that it's 48 times smaller than the real thing. Um, I like it because it's a nice, handy size. Um, it's not too small to, to fit in the details. It's not too large that I have to do all the details, and they fit on my shelf. We call ourselves model builders, but we are, in fact, de facto collectors because we need to have references to do our models. So then the collecting does come into it and we'll buy every issue of a particular series of aviation magazines, for example. I don't just collect the model kits themselves. I also buy lots of reference material books. Uh, there's magazines that come out every month that I like to read. There's the, the aftermarket detail sets and the decals and of course all the paints and the tools. And then there's the collecting that our wives will probably not want to hear but when we walk into a store and we see this model kit that's just looking at us off the shelf saying build me, build me, then we'll want to buy it. So buckle up your ejection seats and let's rumble. You think you're gonna win? I'm going to win. They don't call them zeros for nothing. This is the first time our contestants get to meet each other. Harvey, Tony, Tony, meet Harvey. Your extra fine airbrush tip won't help you now, buddy. <laughs> Hope you're hungry, because you're going to eat some humble pie, pal. All right, so here's what's gonna happen. I've got nine World War II aviation questions in my hand. I'm gonna ask them of each of you separately, and then we're gonna find out who is the true know-it-all in this first showdown. Which British twin-engine aircraft was made of wood? Uh, De Havilland Mosquito. The Mosquito. You guys both answered the De Havilland Mosquito, which is correct. It was nicknamed the Timber Terror, and it was made in, almost entirely out of plywood. De Havilland actually came up with that idea to take advantage of out-of-work furniture makers, and because there wasn't much aluminum to go around. So, which plane dropped the largest conventional bomb during World War II? Lancaster. Uh, Avro Lancaster. You both answered Lancaster, which is correct. And there is an actual Lancaster behind us here in this museum. And the bomb was dropped on March 14th, 1945. And it was the Grand Slam 22,000 pound bomb. See, I told you. What aircraft did the Germans dub the Forked Tail Devil? That would be the P-38 Lightning. The P-38 Lightning. You both said the P-38 Lightning. You got it right. 
It was the mighty twin-boomed Lockheed American fighter. It wasn't originally intended for combat, but it was intended to intercept and destroy enemy bombers. The Allies came up with a system of code names to help identify Japanese aircraft, and fighter aircrafts got masculine names like Tony and Oscar. Bombers got feminine names like Lily and Betty. What type of names was given to training aircraft? Um, trees. Those would be uh, trees. You both said trees, and that is correct. That was a guess. <laughs> <laughs> names of trees just rolled off the tongue a lot easier I than Ku Gisho K5Y, which was Willow, or the Mitsubishi K3M Pine. What did the P in the P-51 Mustang stand for? Mm. Come on. The P. Pursuit. Pursuit. You both answered pursuit, which is correct. It stood for pursuit, and this baby could reach speeds to 500 miles an hour. And after the war, it did end up changing from P-51 to F-51 to stand for fighter. Apart from the Germans, which other two European Air Forces employed a swastika-style design as their national markings during the war? There's the Finns. And? And the Finns. And? <laughs> other than the That Finns. would be the Finns. <laughs> so two? Two. One would be the Finnish. That's one, we need another one. And the other one would be the, the Italians. Harvey, you said the Finns and the Italians. Tony, you said the Finns and, and the, the Finns. Finns. <laughs> <laughs> you're both wrong. Oh, oh yeah, what a shock. Or should I say you're both half right. Uh, Finland did use a blue swastika on a white disc for their Air Force, and for them it meant the Cross of Freedom, but the Latvians were the second of country. And for them it meant the Fire Cross, and they used it, a red swastika on a white disc, from 1918 until 1940 when they were invaded by the Russians. And what was the only Japanese aircraft to bomb the United States mainland during World War II. It was a uh, codenamed aircraft called uh, a Glenn. Oh, I'll bet Harvey got this one. <laughs> um, 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 uh, the, the Siran. Harvey, you answered Glenn, and Tony, you answered Siran. Harvey, you got that one right. It was Glenn, or more specifically, Yokosuka E-14Y, otherwise known as Glenn. Yeah, that and was gonna be my second answer. <laughs> okay, now you tell me. The advantage of knowing World War II <laughs> aircraft came in handy, I might say. So it was a small, tiny seaplane that was transported to the west coast of the United States in an Imperial Japanese Navy submarine in September 1942. One launched from the submarine on two separate occasions and dropped four bombs in a forested area of Oregon. Which biplane was the most widely used elementary trainer for the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan? The de Havilland, not the chipmunk, Tiger Moth. Uh, Tiger Moth. You both said Tiger Moth, which is entirely correct. The Tiger Moth was part of a rite of passage for many pilots in the Commonwealth here in Canada. This is where most of them came to train for that program. What kind of plane was the ME-321? That was a um, transport. Maybe if you would describe how it flew, then you could Answer well, my question. It's a glider. A big, big transport. Big, big transport what? Glider. You both answered 
transport glider. Now, before I tell you what the actual answer is, ME stands for Messerschmitt, famous German aircraft manufacturer, and the ME321 is probably one of the largest gliders ever made to transport. So you both got that one right. Now the final tally is, Harvey, you got eight. You took this match, you got seven right. That means Harvey, if you win in the next round, that's it, game over. You are the champion of Collector Showdown. Tony, you need to win the next one in order to advance to the tiebreaker. That's it for round one, round two of Collector Showdown next. When instant just isn't instant enough. Yeah. And he loses a piece. That's right. We are here at the Toronto Aerospace Museum. It's on the grounds of what was Canada's largest Air Force base and historic site of de Havilland Aircraft Manufacturing Plant. This place isn't just full of history, it made history. In 1929, the de Havilland Aircraft Company manufactured many planes, including its moth aircrafts like the Gypsy Moth and the Tiger Moth, the biplane that many World War II Commonwealth pilots use for training. In the 50s, this place became an Air Force base, the home of Canada's largest Air Force squadron. Canada's first satellite, the Alouette, was launched into space in 1962. Its frame was built in this very building. Today, the museum is the home of artifacts from some of the greatest moments in aerospace history, and many of those past glories are being resurrected. This is a full-scale replica of the legendary Avro Aero, a cutting-edge Delta Wing interceptor. The Aero is the biggest heartbreak in Canadian aerospace history. The entire program was cancelled in the middle stages of testing in the late 50s. The prototypes were destroyed, the blueprints burned. Now this replica stands as a testament to Canada's technological capabilities from an era gone by. This Avro Lancaster is another example of a past glory that's being given a nice facelift. Now we'll see if all of these great pieces of history inspire our contestants as they move on to the next round. In round one, Harvey slipped past Tony in our <laughs> test of knowledge. Now it's time for round two, test of skill. <laughs> Excellent. Super glue. It's round two of Collector Showdown. This is the time where we test your skill. And you can probably tell by what's in front of you as to what we're going to test, what you're going to do for this showdown. You're both <laughs> going it. to build a P-47 Thunderbolt. This is an American fighter. It's 132nd scale, so therefore neither of you should have the advantage. <laughs> <laughs> But since I've never built a model airplane in my life, we have an expert judge with us, Jim Montgomery. He is a fellow modeler and judge, and also he has built many of the models that are here in the Toronto Aerospace Museum. So Jim, what is the criteria? The criterion that we're going to use is primarily completeness and detail. You heard it, completeness and detail. You have no paint in front of you, so you don't have to worry about that, but you do have decals, you have instant glue, instant set spray, and some tape on either side of you in case you get really desperate. And I know this is something you normally take months to a year to do. We are giving you 10 minutes. <laughs> Ready, go. Nine minutes. Are we allowed to talk? <laughs> I'm allowed to take his pieces. You have eight minutes. Yeah, once the once the super glue goes on, it takes Ron to get it apart. <laughs> I ate my Wheaties this morning, yeah. Use, use Nobody ever told you you'd be speed modeling, eh? Right. No. I'm quite impressed with the way they're going. And 
I'm glad I'm not doing it. <laughs> 61 pieces and 10 minutes to put them all together. And he loses a piece. He'll get a good chunk of it done. I'm, I'm frankly amazed at how fast they are, how much they are accomplishing in how short a time. What if we run out of glue? <laughs> if you run out of glue, you've got the tape. <laughs> like I said, if you get desperate, desperate times call for desperate measures. <laughs> When, when instant just isn't instant enough, I stand in front of the microwave going, hurry! So once in a lifetime experience, you'll probably never have to do it this quickly again. I'm <laughs> both thankful for that. <laughs> the hobby is about having fun. How much fun are you guys having right now? <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> Too busy having fun. This is a family it. channel. I'm not okay. supposed to say things. One minute to go. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Put down the models. <laughs> it's, technically it's down. Put down the models. All right, well, I think completeness, we can see which one is more complete. This is where we get into this thing about an only pilot here or pilot there, so. Right. Um, detail. Just detail. Try not to pile it on too thick. Yeah. <laughs> detail is about the same, because they both. Um, oh boy. I got more glue on my hands. They both, they, yeah. both en they both ended up with complete engines, complete cockpits. Uh, this one is more complete in that the, the second wing did get on, while the, this one, the first wing, didn't quite make it. It's a crash scene. Yeah, I figured that. So your final I, judgment? I, I would say the final, final judgment would be this one. And as far as I'm concerned, Harvey wins this round. Harvey, you won Collector Showdown. You are the man. And it wasn't even a Japanese airplane, which is my specialty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tony, you didn't win. <laughs> nope. What happened? I just, you know, speed modeling skills just aren't what they used to be. And they used to be something? Oh, I was lightning quick back in the day. <laughs> so what would you have done differently? I think I would have put all the big pieces together and got it all together as a single airplane instead of worrying about the fiddly bits like the cockpit and the engine. So what are you going to do with this one here now that uh, you're all done with it? I think I'll take it home uh, for my six-year-old son to wreck. Well, why don't you do that with that model? But we have another one here, a 148 scale P47 nice. Thunderbolt for you to take as long <laughs> as you want yeah, this to. This will be about six months. That's awesome. <laughs> six months versus 10 minutes. Well, <laughs> hopefully great. you'll uh, do a better job next time. Oh, I plan to, yep. <laughs> Harvey, I bet you want to know what you won. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm very curious. Well, I'm going to give you a big hint. Okay. Look behind here. De Havilland Tiger Moth. You don't win the plane, but you are going to get to go up in a De Havilland Tiger Moth. Not this Tiger Moth. Oh, yeah? But you're going to really? get to go up in one of these things. Is that right? Oh, that's so cool. Excellent. So we've got to go. We've got a plane waiting for us. <laughs> Harvey, a Tiger Moth. Wow, this is fantastic. I've never seen one up close. How are you doing? Hello. I'm Brian Hope. Nice to meet I'm you. Harvey. Harvey. I'm Director of Flight Operations at Collingwood Classic Aircraft Foundation. This is our 1943 Tiger Moth. Whoa. It's exactly as it would have appeared in 1943. It's wow. completely authentic. It's a British Commonwealth Air Training Plan training aircraft. This is how you would learn to fly in the Second War. And this is Brian Diedenhofen who's going to take Harvey flying today. Hi, Hello. Brian. How authentic of an experience is this going to be for him? When he's in this airplane flying, it'll be exactly and completely identical to as it would have been in 1943. Harvey, where do you want to sit? Where are you going to sit? <laughs> I can go up there, of course. <laughs> can I get in now? Yeah, go! So Harvey, I'm going to show you how to get into this Tiger Moth. You always get in this side, same as a knight gets on his horse from this side. So just step on the wing walk, mm -hmm. and you can hold on to anything black. <laughs> Step on the seat. This is amazing. It's very tight. You'll find. It's very tight. I can imagine the pilots would have had all that gear on. 
Yeah. That's why they get people to help them. <laughs> wow. Okay, so we'll strap you in. Mm -hmm. Shoulder harness, of course, because this is a fully aerobatic airplane. Can't see a thing, can you? No, I'm surprised because the nose is so high up. Well, if you're going to fly a Mustang or a Spitfire next, you can't see out of them either until the tail comes up. So. I have to. Well, so when you're taking off, like you have to put the head out the side. Absolutely, and it hurts when it's raining. So. Got your flying helmet here. Okay. You can help that there. Just slides Harvey. on down there. There you okay. go. I can't hear a thing. No, that's good. You got your chin strap there. You want to go flying? Yeah. All right. Say, but wow, fantastic! That's Collector Showdown rocks. <laughs> that was amazing, Harvey. Yeah, that so was. So, what was it like up there? I mean, I heard you say it's amazing and it rocks. Well, I mean, words can't describe it. It's. Can I take this? <laughs> sure you can. God, it's a little easier to hear with it. It was just. Oh, that was great. So, I got to fly the thing too. Did you really? <laughs> yeah. That was amazing, yeah. I mean, what words can describe it? Just just the sheer experience of having read about it all the time. And I used to think that smelling model paints was an experience. <laughs> <laughs> now smelling leather and leaky oil. And Why is it scary when you're given the controls? You know, admittedly, yeah. I know most, most <laughs> macho guys would say, nah, no. But no, it was a little nervous knowing that he's sitting back there made a great help. But once you got the stick, it was it was a bit nervous and then it started to turn it a bit. It was a little bit, uh, and he was like, gentle, right? You were yeah, gentle, yeah. but it's got a nice feel once you have the stick in your hands and the plane's moving with your, with your hand. It's just an un unbelievable experience. Now I just have to build one now. That's right. Right? Is that oh, going to be your next model? Yeah, it's going to be one of my next. Oh, definitely. Yeah. No, it was a truly, a truly, truly, an, 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 a, just a, what can I see? I'm speechless. And it was an amazing experience. So thank you so much to everybody. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody. It was just fabulous. Today on Collector Showdown, we are taking you inside the intriguing realm of fantasy fiction. I feel great. You're going down, Frank. <laughs> yeah, my mom beat the troll. <laughs> I'm going to give you my best shot. Hell dear. Seven. Luke Skywalker. Go get half a point. I wonder what Tolkien would have done. Ruth, I'm coming after you. Think again. We must be going to the same place. Indeed. We are here at a Lord of the Rings gathering because it's the perfect place to stage a showdown. Two fantasy fiction collectors will compete for the chance of winning a once-in-a-lifetime mystery prize. On Collector Showdown, there are two challenges. First, a test of knowledge. Second, a test of skill. If our contestants are tied after the first two rounds, we go to a sudden death showdown. 
The prize will be a dream come true for only one of these two collectors. Will it be Ruth, the sentimental collector of fantasy memorabilia, or Frank, the avid collector of fantasy figures? You're just gonna have to watch and find out. People who like fantasy are eclectic readers. Fantasy is Beowulf, it's ancient texts. Fantasy, of course, is C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, J.K. Rowling and the Harry Potter universe. Even things we think of as science fiction or horror, like H.P. Lovecraft, like Star Wars, actually fit under the umbrella of fantasy. Fantasy has always been popular, but there's something new now. I think we really have more than anyone George Lucas to thank for bringing special effects to the level that they are now. Now that we can have CGI Gollum or Aslan, or for that matter, Yoda, we see a whole new group of people drawn into the literature through the cinema. And I think the cinema is responsible for a flourishing a renaissance of interest, not only in the films, not only in the books, but all the things that come with that, including merchandising, including collecting. Fantasy collections run the gamut from first edition prints of books to things like miniatures, autographs, particularly now that fantasy has become such a cinematic presence. And there are fan-made creations that people collect as well. Things for costuming, for example, things for different kinds of gaming. Events like this, the Gathering of the Fellowship, are a worldwide phenomenon. Any given weekend, there is an event like this being held someplace in the world. The international nature of this fan base really is an ingredient of creating a family, a global family of fans and collectors. Now it's time to meet our collectors. My name's Frank. Uh, pretty much I'm an avid uh, Lord of the Rings collector. I've loved uh, Lord of the Rings since I was a little child. Got into Lord of the Rings collecting uh, four or five years ago as soon as the movies came out. My name is Ruth and I collect Lord of the Rings fantasy things from both the movies and J.R.R. Tolkien. I started collecting in 2002. In my collection, I probably have over 100 pieces from bookmarkers to posters. Right now I have about 40 pieces in my collection. I used to have more, but I trade with other collectors I've met and uh, that keeps the collection ever growing. This is pretty much where my collection started five years ago. These were typically available for five or ten dollars and they're neat and serve their purpose, but then I uh, found out about these other statues. Sideshow Collectibles is a collectibles company based out of California. They made a partnership with Weta who did the digital and uh, all the effects for Lord of the Rings and they got together and decided to make uh, collectibles. My collection is somewhat sentimental for me because it's a part of my family and friends. This is Gollum. My husband and my children gave this to me for my birthday. This is the Chronicle series that I first started reading and it's my husband's set. The value to me is a piece called the Urukai Scout Swordsman. I like it because it's a very dynamic pose. It's not a main character or anything like that, but just the way it was designed, the way the creature's running, it's got a sword in its hand, it's got a bow, it's got a look on his face, it's really vibrant. One of my favorite pieces is the uh, Myth and Magic book by John Howe, who was one of the conceptual artists uh, from the film. He was doing a book signing. He actually drew Gandalf for us and signed it, which was wonderful. The most valuable piece I have is probably the Cave Troll. It sells for about $1,500 in the secondary market now. And they're very hard to find. Another fabulous piece is a stamp collection that I was able to obtain from a friend of mine. So this is all the way from New Zealand, which to me it's like, wow. My favorite part of this collection is the Red Book of Westmarch. This book was a custom project by some members of Lord of the Rings Guide. They spent two years researching J.R. Tolkien and putting together a book for a few of us fans. It's a custom project. This was never available for sale. And the detail and the research that went into this book is just amazing. The kids, my son loves the battle scenes. He loves the sword fights. My daughter's a little bit sick of me. Every time I come home with something, she's like, okay, not Lord of the Rings again. <laughs> Whereas my son's right into it. <laughs> I remember us getting the Two Towers PlayStation game. There was some excitement when I beat the troll. For my son to be really proud of me, it was a great moment. To say, yeah, my mom beat the troll. <laughs> Whatever the collectible is, it reminds me about uh, something I like about that movie or a specific scene or a moment or a feeling that that gives you. Some people like collecting uh, vases, maybe. This is my thing. I want to enjoy my collection. I think that's the foremost for me. People have gasped. You know, you shouldn't open up those, you know, card game or the games or the calendars because, you know, they could be worth something someday. But I thought, you know, I, I don't want everything in plastic. You deal with so much day-to-day -day life. Fantasy takes your mind off of that. It, it lets you think. You dream a little bit. Okay, Frank, so you think you know your fantasy genre? Think again. Ruth, I'm coming after you. I'm going to give you my best shot. 
This is the first time our contestants actually get to meet each other face to face. Ruth, this is Frank. Frank, meet Ruth. Do you have anything to say to each other? Well, Frank, you're going down like the Tower of Badadur. <laughs> oh no, Orc grunts. That doesn't sound good. Are you ready for this first challenge? I hope so. I am, <laughs> definitely. I have nine questions in my hand that I will ask of each of you. I want you to write your answers down on the cards provided and find out who will win round one. Which elf did not appear at the Battle of Helm's Deep in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, but led elvish forces at Helm's Deep in Peter Jackson's film? Ruth, what is your answer? My answer is Haldir. Frank, what is your answer? My answer is Haldir as well. And the answer is... How dear, you both got it right. You're tied 1-1. One, one. Craig Parker, who's actually here at the gathering of the fellowship, played the role of Haldir in the movie. His role was greatly expanded so that he led the forces at Helm's Deep, which is something he didn't do in the book. What is the name of the literary circle to which both J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis belonged? Frank, what's your answer? Gathering. Ruth, what is yours? The Inklings. The Inklings. Yes. And the answer is the Inklings. Yeah. Ruth, you got boo, that right. Boo, boo. They were a literary group associated right. with Oxford University. Both J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis were members of the group along with many other academics. And this is where they got together to critique each other's work. And many of their major works were shaped in these regular meetings that they held. So very good, Ruth. You have two. Frank, one. How many books make up the complete chronicles of Narnia? Ruth, what is your answer? My answer is seven. And Frank, what I do you say? I also wrote seven. And the answer is seven. <laughs> the Chronicles of Narnia were C.S. Lewis's most popular books, selling over 100 million copies in 41 countries. So you both got that one right. Ruth, you're at three. Frank, you're at two. Who carried the only purple lightsaber in the Star Wars science fantasy films? Uh, Frank, what is your answer? Mace Windu. Ruth? Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker. And the answer is Mace Windu. Oh, Frank, no, you got that right. one? That was easy, yeah. Now you're both tied 3-3. Three, three. Mace Windu is the legendary Jedi Master and one of the last members of the Jedi Council. Samuel L. Jackson played him in the movie, and he actually requested that of George Lucas, that he could carry a unique lightsaber so he would stand out in a crowd. So congratulations, Woo! Frank. What is the name of the Lord of the Rings illustrator who painted the covers of the two illustrated editions of the Silmarillion? There aren't that many official Tolkien illustrators. Yeah, okay. So, Ruth, what's your answer? I think it's John Howe. Frank? I put Ted Nasmith. And the answer is... Ted Naismith. Oh! Frank, you got this one right. Ted Naismith is the one who Excellent. illustrated the covers of both illustrated editions of the Silmarillion. He had a number of his paintings inside both of those as well. So congratulations, Frank, you got that one right. You are now leading mm -hmm. at four. Ruth, you have three. In the world of Harry Potter, what great honor is named after an Arthurian fantasy hero? Oh, man. Well, Frank looks confident. Frank, what's your answer? I wrote Order of the Phoenix. And Ruth? Oh, I said knighthood. 
Knighthood, the answer is the Order of Merlin. Oh, okay. Neither of you got that one right. And that is a great honor bestowed upon great wizards who are able to promote living harmoniously with muggles, and those are people without any magical abilities. And uh, Professor Albus Dumbledore held the Order of Merlin. So, Frank, you're still leading at four. Ruth? Go get half a point. What type of talking animal impersonated Aslan the lion in one of the later Chronicles of Narnia books? A type of animal impersonated him? Yes, it was a talking animal. Ruth, what's your answer? I thought leopard. <laughs> Frank? I went with wolf. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is a donkey. Oh, okay, there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was Puzzle That's the right. donkey and Shift the mischievous ape who tricked Puzzle into wearing the skin of a lion and to impersonate Aslan to try and take over the whole world of Narnia. So, Frank, oh, you are gosh. leading. Oh. Four. Actually, I was going to say monkey. You have three nine. right. We have two questions left. Which relation of Bilbo and Frodo Baggins most wanted to own their home on Bagshot Row in the Shire? Frank, your answer? Lobelia Sackville Baggins. Did I just have Ruth? Sackville Baggins? Yeah. Sackville Baggins, it was the Sackville Baggins who wanted to take over the home of Bilbo, which later became the home of Frodo. Of course, it went to Samwise Gamgee in the end, but uh, Lobelia wanted it very badly. So there's one question left. Frank, you have five. Ruth, you have four. Frank, if you get this one right and you don't, you win this one. Ruth, if you get this one right and we tie in round one, the winner of round two will take all. After whom did C.S. Lewis name the character Lucy in The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe? Ruth, what is your answer? I think it was his niece. Frank? I said his daughter. And the answer is neither of those. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is his goddaughter, Lucy oh, Barfield. That was a good guess. Lucy Barfield was the daughter of Owen Barfield, who was a fellow inkling, and she became the goddaughter of C.S. Lewis, and that's who he named Lucy after. Round one Frank, five. Ruth, four. Frank, you won. Round one Woo! of Collector Showdown. How do you feel? I feel great. <laughs> I of won. Yes, you do. You, you won the first round. Hey, you won the first one, round. One what about time. you, Ruth? Um, I'm making a comeback. You're making a comeback? I'm making a comeback. All right, so this is what happens. We're going into round two. Frank, if you win round two, it's a skills challenge. You win Collector Showdown. Ruth, if you win round two, it's a tie. We go to a sudden death showdown. That's round two, Collector Showdown next. <laughs> I don't know what I would do if I were in their situation. <laughs> I still don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> what? Ah! Ah! Come on. Welcome back to Collector Showdown. In round one, Woo! Frank narrowly defeated Ruth in a test of fantasy fiction knowledge, which means if Frank wins the test of skill in round two, he wins it all. To stay in the game, Ruth must take the win in this round to force a sudden death showdown. This is round two, Collector Showdown. Frank, you won round one. If you win this, you win Collector Showdown and get to claim our fabulous mystery prize. Ruth, you need to win this I round. Am. I To will. force this to a sudden death showdown. Okay. Tiebreaker. So Frank, how do you feel? I don't know, I'm kind of nervous looking at the stable here. <laughs> you, you should be. Ruth? I'm excited. You're Very excited? excited? Yes, can't wait. Let's Excellent. go. Excellent. Ladies, can we Reveal the skills challenge. <laughs> oh. Oh, my. oh. Okay. You are both going to build a beast of legend. 
You have many tools in front of you, Play-Doh, you have feathers, sequins, and markers, and uh, little tiny pom-poms. And these materials here, if you both want them, <laughs> you're going to have to fight over them. So you're going to have to build a beast of legend. You're going to have to name it as well. And you're also going to have to use your imagination because you're going to give it magical powers. But before we start, I want to introduce our expert judge, Amy Sturgis. Come on in. Hi. Amy Hi. Sturgis is a scholar and professor of science fiction and fantasy from Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. And she is going to judge your beasts of legend. So Amy, what are you going to judge them on? Well, three criteria. How good it looks how creative it is, and how well your description fits within the genre of fantasy. Frank, how do you feel? <laughs> I'm kind of nervous, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth, what do you think, now that you see everything in front of you? Um, I'm excited. I'm, my mind is already turning. So. Your mind is already turning? Yes. Well, that's good, because yes. you know what? You have 10 minutes to complete this starting uh, now. Okay. So Frank's going for the Play-Doh. Ruth is going for the cups. I wonder what J.R.R. Tolkien would have done yes, if he'd okay. been given yes. uh, this table full of supplies. You have nine minutes to go. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is tough. I don't know what I would do if I were in their situation. I still don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> And remember, you have to come up with a name and magical abilities for them. So while you're building, rack your brain and think of a name for your beasts of legend. Okay. Is that a oh, breathing oh, tube, I wonder, Frank? I still don't know what I'm building, but it's, we're working on it. We are coming up to the halfway mark. Five minutes down, <laughs> five to go. Frank is... Is this a planned Well, thing? the important thing, it looks that way. It's not really <laughs> or are you just it. winging it? I'm, I'm no winging it as I go along intended. here. Yes, no. Sparkle yes, action is pom -poms cool. In here. But I can't uh, bias the judge, so. Oh, really? Ooh. Yeah, I know, I can't bias the judge. So open for it. Looks like there's some beast of legend surgery happening. <laughs> <laughs> you have three minutes to go. Check out the mouth on this beast. <laughs> but does a beast have to be nasty? Does a beast have to be mean? Oh, not at all. You have one minute to go. Frank, <laughs> if you win this, you're the winner of Collector Showdown. Ruth, this is the round that determines whether or not you force a sudden death showdown tiebreaker. We are at 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Put down your crafts. Okay. <laughs> Ruth, please introduce us to your host of legends. Well, this is Wing Wise, and he is a bird. He is able to fly over. He has special vision. And he also has laser, and he can destroy his enemies with his laser oh, eyes. Oh, wow. And he's very wise as well, but his talons are also dangerous, and that's why I have them uh, out like that. He could destroy his enemies with his talons. Yeah, so that's um, Wise Wing. Wise Wing. Wise Wing. All right, so we've met Wise Wing. Frank, please introduce us to your beast of legend. I, I like to call the scary beast the Bow Blob. <laughs> Basically, Bow -blob? the Bow Blob, yes. <laughs> Basically what happened is Gandalf and the Balrog fought and uh, Gandalf defeated the Balrog and Gandalf was reincarnated as Gandalf the White. So now the Balrog was reincarnated as the Balblob. So he has his fire whip back and his fire sword, but now he also shoots lightning balls out of his butt. Lightning balls out of his butt? Yes, yes. So he's got this big tube here and just, they, they shoot right out. Amy, you know, you tell me what you think. I like wingwise, mm -hmm. uh, the sense of action that you get uh, from this particular beast of legend. Uh, you can see things happening, coming from the eyes, coming from the talons, and you can imagine him being 
both uh, light on the wing and sparkly, which is always nice, mm -hmm. moving through the sky. And the nose is a nice touch too, the little beak going on. So that's a very impressive beast of legend. And now Frank's. The bow blob has a lot going on there. Uh, I like the fact that he ties in so clearly to pre-existing uh, legend, and he's got weapons on both hands, and of course the, uh, <laughs> the special <laughs> action that he has there. Um, what does it do again, Frank? <laughs> it shoots lightning balls out of his butt. Lightning balls <laughs> out of his butt. That's, yeah. uh, that's something to reckon with. I wouldn't want to meet either of these in a dark alley. That's all I can say. So just to recap, though, Frank, you won round one. If you win this, then you win Collector Showdown and our fabulous mystery prize. Ruth? I know. It's not a clear winner here, so you could still win this if you force a sudden death showdown tiebreaker. Amy, this is the time when you have to tell us which one it's is the winner. Choice. You have to choose one. They're both very creative and they both look great, but I think I'm gonna have to go with the bow blob because he's <laughs> hanging together well and he has a very coherent story behind him uh, that ties into lots of things. So, <laughs> gonna have to say the bow blob. The bow blob, Greg, you. you are the winner of Collector yes. Showdown. Yes. Woo! <laughs> How do you feel? I feel great and I want to have to thank my family because if I didn't win this, my daughter would kill me. Because my daughter's very artistic and if I lost this, I wouldn't hear the end of it. Frank, you are going to find yeah. out what our mystery prize is very shortly. <laughs> <laughs> but before we tell Frank all about the amazing prize pack we have for him, we wanted to give Ruth something memorable for her efforts. Bruce Hopkins, who plays Gambling in the Lord of the Rings movies, and Craig Parker, who plays Hal Deer, are attending the gathering from their native New Zealand to meet their fans. And we know Ruth is dying to meet them. Ruth, I'm so sorry. You didn't I win, know. but did you enjoy yourself at I least? I had a blast. It was amazing. Thank you so much. You definitely put up a good fight, and there are a couple of people here who want to meet you. Oh, okay. Who Definitely know what it's like to put up a good fight. Okay. <laughs> Who? <laughs> oh my god! I'm sorry. In case you don't right. recognize them, Craig Parker, of course Bruce I Hopkins, recognize them. Oh, otherwise you. known oh as Hal Deer and Gambling. Oh gosh, We're on your yes. consolation prize, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excellent. I'm so just going to leave you two, yeah. you three okay. alone. I've got to uh, go visit Frank and get ready for his big prize. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, having a little party at the back. You want to come? come here. Sure. Oh, yeah. What? Ah! Oh, take me. Take me across the... Oh, no, no. Craig, there she is. Oh, my God. Ah! This is amazing. Oh, these are the other finalists. You're looking great. Just hanging out. Ah! Okay. <laughs> Frank, congratulations. You are the winner of Collector Showdown. How do you Thank feel? You. I feel uh, amazing. I'm uh, surprised I won, actually. It was a great experience. I loved it. Well, that was quite the weapon coming out of yeah. uh, your yeah. Beast of Legends butt. I, I, I think that I might have been a clincher. Yeah. So you're probably wondering what you want. Yes, I am. Well, we've got quite the prize pack for you. First of all, we have a, two tickets to go see Lord of the Rings musical in Toronto courtesy of Mervish Entertainment. Excellent. There awesome. you go. Have you seen that no, yet? No, I haven't. And we were planning on seeing this, my wife and I. This is perfect. Excellent. And then in my hand is prize number two, Minas Morgul Sideshow Figurine. Oh, that's beautiful. That's just, uh, we, were, we were just talking about this in the lobby, that we were thinking about getting one of these, and I, I can't believe this is one of the prizes. So you want, this is one that you wanted? This is absolutely something I wanted, yes. But this isn't all there is. There's, There's another more. part to the prize. There's actually the main prize. Ted Naismith, come on out. Ted Naismith is one of a small handful of artists accepted by Tolkien publishers. His work was first printed in a 1987 calendar. The art was so beautiful, Naismith's paintings were used on the covers of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings paperback in 1996. Naismith's crowning achievement was creating all of the artwork for the first illustrated hardcover of The Silmarillion, an unsung Tolkien masterpiece. You can buy one of his paintings if you like, but be prepared to shell out about $8,000. 
I understand that you're uh, quite the trivia buff and that you got my name right when you answered the question correctly. So uh, I uh, have done a little drawing on your behalf. It's absolutely awesome. An original it's sketch awesome, yeah. by an official Tolkien illustrator. That means a lot. For you. There you go. Beautiful. One of a kind. Thank you so much. I love that. I love it. So describe this for us, Ted. Yeah, this is my uh, interpretation of Minas Morgul, the realm of the Nazgul, uh, as we all know in, in The Lord of the Rings. Congratulations. What do you Thank think? Thank you so much. I'm, I'm speechless. That's just absolutely beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much for playing. Thank you very much. Thank you all. It's just awesome. We are here today at the Molson Grand Prix in Toronto, and is this ever one loud sport? We're going to watch as two motorsports collectors go head to head for the chance of winning an amazing prize. A prize that we're keeping secret from them both until the very end. Being there and seeing the cars, I was hooked. This is outrageous what I've done to this apartment. Pressure's on. The pressure is on. Um, 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 that's tough. That was a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to see you in my rear of a mirror, buddy. When the checkered flag drops, I'm going to be the winner. May the best man win. After showdown, there are two challenges. First, a test of knowledge. Second, a test of skill. If our contestants are tied after the first two rounds, we go to a sudden death showdown. The stakes are high and the winner takes all. The prize will be a dream come true for only one of these two collectors. Will it be Steve, fan of Formula One, NASCAR and Hot Wheels models? Or will it be Dave with his keen interest in Ferrari and Formula One? You'll just have to watch and find out. This Grand Prix racing event has showcased some of the best in international racing talent since 1986. The fastest cars here today will be going up to 190 miles per hour on an 11 turn circuit that's only 1.8 miles long. Over 2 million spectators attend Grand Prix races all over the world in any given year. At every race, vendors sell scores of souvenirs and memorabilia making these kinds of events a mecca for motorsports collectors. Everybody likes to collect a, whether it's a favourite team, a favourite driver or a certain piece that's coming out. If you go to a race a uh, weekend, you'll see the stands there, you know, see thousands of hats being sold, t-shirts. You get to the track, you see something there that takes your fancy, you collect one piece, you see another, and before you know it, you've got a couple of hundred of them. Once you start, you can't stop. My name's Steve, I've been collecting probably about 15, 20 years now, ever since I was a young kid. And I always had Hot Wheel cars as a kid, uh, dinky cars, matchbox, that type of thing. Hi, I'm David. Um, I'm an avid collector of uh, F1 and Champ Car. I've been collecting the series for about 10 years now. Basically collect anything from die-cast models to drawings to pieces of an actual car. By 1974, my dad took me to the first Formula One race of my life at Mosport, and from then, I was hooked. Being there and seeing the cars, they were so loud. And my cousin, he had all these cool model cars. So, wow, I like that, that's kind of neat. So I just started buying model cars and building them. Oddly enough, it started with my sister buying me one Ferrari die cast and it snowballed from there pretty much and it's, it's become quite an addiction. How many cars do I have in my collection? Uh, lost count over 100. I'd have to estimate about 2,000 cars. Two to three thousand cars. We've got some of our Ferrari road cars, which I'm a big fan of. We also have some Michael Schumacher models, probably the best driver ever born in F1 to date. The centerpiece of what I have in this collection is the car commemorating the seven-time championship of Schumacher's career. These are the ones that started all. These are my original Hot Wheels as a kid. And as you can see, my collection has grown. And boy, do you think I like Hot Wheels? I love Hot Wheels, especially the old red line ones that I had as a kid. They're the ones that bring back the most memories. Probably the best piece that I have in this collection by far is the Paul Tracy 110 scale model of his champion car team players from 2003. It took me about two to three months to work on this model. As you can see, these are my paintings. I've done these by myself, and I've been lucky enough to find all the drivers and have them autograph my paintings. 
There's not a lot of collections around that have this type of thing. It's an actual BBS rim that I obtained from the Panos racing team. It was actually signed by most of the drivers, if not all of them, at the Toronto Mossport event in 2003. I paid the guy 50 bucks and he gave it to me. Um, to one, it's junk. To me, it's, it's a prize collection. I also have an awesome motorsports poster collection. I also have my collection of hats. You guessed it, there's more. <laughs> and these are meant to be played with. This is outrageous what I've, what I've done to this apartment. If I don't win this, my friends are gonna be so let down. I'm a bit nervous about it, quite honestly. And there's like, no way you can lose this thing. It's yours, it's wrapped up. So Steve, I'll see you there with your tricycle. When the checkered flag drops, I'm gonna be the winner. Steve, you don't have a chance. <laughs> This is the first time our contestants actually get to meet each other face to face. Dave, meet Steve. Steve, meet Dave. How you doing, Dave? All right. You ready to uh, trade some paint here? Do a little fender rubbing? Max, I'm ready to see you in my rear view mirror, buddy. My car is so fast it doesn't have a rear view mirror because I know worry about what's behind. May the best man win. It is time for the test of knowledge. Now, I'm sorry for dragging you guys inside, but I promise we will get a chance to go outside later. It's just a little noisy out there. So I have nine questions that I'm going to ask of each of you. I want you to write your answers down on the cards provided. Whoever gets the most number of questions right wins round one of Collector Showdown. Here we go. What do the letters in NASCAR stand for? Come on. Oh, God, I can't even spell. <laughs> Dave, your answer is? The National Association Sport Car Automobile Racing. And Steve, what is your answer? The National Association of Stock Car Auto Racing. And the actual answer is the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing. So that is one point for you, Steve. You okay. got that one right, Dave? Let's go. Zero for you. Yep. In the history of the sport, what nation has provided more Formula One competitors than any other oh. country? The wheels are turning. Wow, that's a good one. That's a good um, one. Um, we'll try this one. I don't know. Dave, what is your answer? Uh, I'm guessing Brazil. Steve, what is your answer? Same answer. <laughs> and the actual answer is USA. Brazil so may have dominated, but in the history of the sport, the United States of America has provided Formula more one. Formula One drivers than any other wow. country, even though there is only currently one Formula One driver, Scott Speed. Uh. Steve, you're still ahead. <laughs> okay. One, zero. Dave, you can still make All it up. All right, let's do this. What year was it when the Indy Racing League and CART, the championship auto racing teams, First held races as separate leagues. It's going to be... Dave, what is your answer? 1996. Steve? 1999. And the actual answer is 1996. That is the year when they first held their races as separate leagues. It was a bitter, bitter divorce. No kidding. Yeah. A no split kidding. that fans are still upset yes, about we to are. this day. Dave, oh, you got geez. this one. Oh, you tied it up 1-1. Yes, one, one. What color stripe across the rear of a NASCAR race car signifies a rookie driver? <laughs> I'm so dead. Dave, what's your answer? I'm going to go with green. Uh, green? Because you're new at the sport. And Steve, what Every is... Every good racer knows it's yellow. <laughs> and the actual answer is yellow. That is the color that rookie drivers use 
in the NASCAR series to signify that they are in fact first timers, rookies. Steve, you are up two, two to one. one. Excellent. What Formula One driver, either current or retired, has accumulated the most number of points without a Formula One victory? Oh, current or retired without a Formula One victory? Say it's either. That's tough. That's tough. This is a horrible yeah. guess, but and I know he hasn't won a race, so. Try. Dave? What do you say? Jensen Button. Steve? Jensen Button, good one. Elio DeAngelis? The actual answer <laughs> is Jensen oh, Button. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> he is the British driver of Honda's yeah, F1 one. team, yep. and he has accumulated 183 points, but has never won a oh, Formula One race. Right. So you've tied it up. Oh, two, two. What color of flag is waved on a champ car track when a driver must go to the pit? Well, that Ready? was quick. That was Dave, quick. We all know what that. do you say? Black. Black. Black flag. Steve? Black flag. And the answer is black. So you're tied 3 3. This round could still go either way. In the world of auto racing, which Schumacher is the fastest? Oh, this is going to be tricky. You got to say it. Trick question. Dave, tell me what you think. I hope this is right. Is it Joel Schumacher? Steve? It's going to be Michael. I don't know. And the actual answer is neither. Neither? It's Tony, Tony. Schumacher. Oh, Drag racing. Michael Drag may racing. have won oh. seven Formula One World Championships, and his younger brother, Ralph, may be a Formula One driver. It was Tony Schumacher who hit 333.08 miles per hour in a National Hot Rod Association drag race in Pennsylvania back in 2001. That was a trick question. Good one, good one. That was a trick question. <laughs> that was nice a trick question. <laughs> so you're They're still not tied. They're not related. Three, three. Now you are both big collectors of die cast models, but have you ever thought of what they're made of? I want to know the mixture of the two most commonly used metals that go into die cast oh. models. How well do you know your collection? Um, You're tied 3-3 three, three right now. Will either of you get ahead on this question? It's a tough one. This is really bad. All right. Dave, what's your answer? Stealing Cooper. I'm copper. <laughs> Stealing copper. Detroit, tin okay. And zinc. Tin and zinc. The actual answer is zinc and aluminum. aluminum. So you oh. got it close, but Half not point. quite on. close enough. <laughs> aluminum. Die cast models are made when you pour molten liquid metal right. into a cast. mold. It's zinc and aluminum. So. Wow. You are both tied 3-3. Three, three. questions. One question left. Who is going to get ahead? Oh. <laughs> Whoever gets this one right, and if the other one does not, you win round one of Collector Showdown. Either one of you could take this round. All right. Pressure's on. Who is the youngest driver to ever win a champ car race? Ah. Um, I'm, 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 I'm. I'm second guessing myself here. To, uh, yes. I don't know. Well, I know who was. I'm gonna put. I think he's been beat, but we'll see. Dave, what's your answer? Let's do this, Scott Dixon. Tell me, Scott Dixon. Steve. Was it Greg Moore? He was at the time. This is the last question. You're both tied three-three. One of you can win this right now, and I'm gonna tell you, one of you got the answer right. 
The actual answer is Scott Dixon. Ah, he was 20 years, nine months, wow. and 14 days old when he I became the youngest young. person to ever win a wow, champ car wow. race. And that was in Pennsylvania back in 2001. So Dave, <laughs> Holy. Well, you took boy. round one of Collector Showdown. Congratulations. Those were Steve? tough questions. <laughs> Steve, you can still make it up. You win the next round. You can force a sudden death showdown tiebreaker. Oh boy. And then one of you will get to claim our fabulous mystery prize. Are you guys ready? Let's do it. Let's do this. Let's go. <laughs> well, naturally, I feel nervous about going into the second round, but I'm just ready to go and do it. Confident. Yep. Try something different. See how it goes. That's it for round one. Round two of Collector Showdown next. It's a lifetime experience right now. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> in round one of Collector Showdown, Dave defeated Steve in a test of knowledge. If Dave wins the next round, the test of skill, he'll claim our mystery prize. Steve needs to win to force a sudden death showdown. We are here inside Pit Lane in the Rocket Sports Pit area. For the Skills Challenge, you are both going to get your hands dirty today. You're going to change a tire on this car, but you're not going to do this green. We don't expect you to know how to change a tire on a race car. So we have Wayne Hill here with us. Come on in, Wayne. Wayne is a pit mechanic for the Rocket Sports race team. Rocket Sports Racing entered the Champ Car World Series in 2003. Team driver Tony's Casamets is in the running for Rookie of the Year, so he's hoping for a great race with this car. Do you have any words of advice for these guys? Uh, I think the most important thing is just to take your time. You know, don't try and go fast, and it'll, it'll go together nicely. Okay, so Wayne is going to give us a quick demonstration, so pay attention. The first part of it is taking the wheel nut off. It's quite important to make sure the gun you know, goes on straight. If you cock it slightly, it's not on straight. You have a chance of hitting this lock here. Okay. And if you hit that, then you're in a world of trouble. This side's a little bit easier. All you need to do is drop the gun and it'll automatically change, ready to go back on. And then the next step is look where you're going to grab the wheel. Yep. Once you've got hold of the wheel, then you can look to grab the other wheel. Yep. As you're taking one off, just like that. So what do you guys think? You're going to get to change an actual tire on a Rocket Sports race car, champ car, Steve? I'm nervous, but let's do it. I'm ready. Let's go. What about you, Dave? This is a lifetime experience right now. This is going to be awesome. Take your positions, men. In a typical race, it takes a professional pit crew member six to eight seconds to jump over the wall and change a front tire. Let's see how our contestants compare. Ready? Let her up. Are you set? <laughs> Go. Oh. <laughs> That's a good while. <laughs> <laughs> you did all right. You took your time and everything went nicely. A little bit of a fumble, so. Obviously, goes to this guy. So it goes to this guy. Steve, you are the winner of the skills challenge. You forced a sudden death showdown because you, Dave, won the first round. You won the second round. We go to a sudden death showdown. Cool. Gentlemen, may the best man win. Uh, I think the key to my victory was just being slow, like you said, and going through the motions and just carrying out as he showed me. If I could do it over again, I probably would have taken my time and slowed things down and focused a little better than I did before. I got the old jitters here going, but uh, I can't wait to see what this prize is all about. Sudden death, <laughs> this is a nerve-wracking uh, part of the contest, and I'm ready to go. I can't wait to do it. In this sudden death showdown, I will show our contestants a race and a year, and they have to correctly identify who won that race. If they both get a right, we continue. If they both get a wrong, we continue. As soon as one of them gets the answer right when the other one does not, that person wins Collector Showdown and gets to claim our fabulous mystery prize. Dave, you won the first round, the trivia portion, the test of knowledge, 
Steve, you won round two, the skills challenge. So the whole game is up for grabs right now with this sudden death showdown. Wow. Are you ready? I'm ready, but I don't remember dates and times, so we're going to have to do it, though. Let's do it. Let's just do it. <laughs> Woohoo! All right, guys, shake hands and may the best man win. Number one, tell me who is the winner. Steve, what is your answer? Michael Schumacher. Dave, tell me what you wrote down. Regrettably, Fernando Alonso. Now, if one of you got the answer right here and the other one did not, that's it. Game over. And I can tell you that one of you got the answer right. <laughs> oh, I know I got it wrong. Uh -oh. It just hit Sudden me. Sudden death showdown. That's it. First try, Steve, you are the winner. Woo! Congratulations, Steve. That was that was well thought <laughs> under pressure, man. Right. Excellent. That's great. Wow. Well, you guys both right. did really well. Woohoo! What do you win? You'll find out <laughs> next. <laughs> Dave, you have access, crazy access, all day long. You got to get your hands dirty on a race car tire. What do you think? How do you feel? Yeah, it's the best feeling a race fan could ever have to be here and this close to the action. I know you are a super collector, so what are your plans for the rest of the day? <laughs> I got to get back on the ball here and uh, probably head over to the paddock and meet my girlfriend and my, and my buddies and just pick up where we left off, get some more autographs, uh, meet some players and... You know, just have a good time. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. And you can start enjoying the rest of the weekend. Turn around. We've got a surprise for you. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> this is a surprise. <laughs> I guess this is the consolation prize. Beautiful women. Race cars. What more could you want? I'm really happy with this prize. That's good. Steve? You won Collector Showdown. You you didn't win the test of knowledge, no. but you whooped butt in the test of skill. And then you took the Sudden Death Showdown, so I bet you're wondering what your prize is. I've been waiting for weeks to know what the prize is going to be. I'm dying. Come Excellent. on. Excellent. Well, you got a little taste of it in the skills challenge. You got your hands dirty, but now you're going to get the full effect. Excellent. You are going to get to spend the afternoon with Rocket Sports team as an honorary pit crew member, and they are going to put you to work. Awesome. Wow. Wow. That's cool. That's cool. I've never done it before, so it's going to be an experience. I'm ready. Well, let's find out what you're going to do. Patrick, come on in. What are you going to make this man do today? Hi there, Steve. Uh, well, we're going to, first of all, you're going to put a hat on because you're uh, now part of the team, and you're going to be working out on the pit wall, working out on the pit wall during qualifying, so... You'll be basically um, making sure that Tony's can see the pit board and we can relay the information in addition to the stuff we talked to him over the radio. Here's a radio for you to wear, so I'll be talking to you and making sure that you're putting out the right stuff for him. Excellent. Cool. Okay, so there you go. Well, this is so cool. This is a rare opportunity for Steve. I love the smell and the fuel and the rubber. He's stationed in a place where half of the pit crew is denied access. I can hear you. How am I? His job is to hold up a sign telling the driver what lap he is on and what position he's in. It's an important job that puts Steve inches away from cars traveling almost 200 miles an hour. We're down to lap four now, is that correct? For a race car fan like Steve, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. He doesn't know it yet, but it's only one part of our surprise for him. He won't believe what's coming up next. He is back! Woo! Steve, how was that? <laughs> Well, that was definitely a thrill of a lifetime, that's for sure, no doubt about it. And the, the speed out of the wall, nowhere else you can feel that speed. They're inches away, literally. You know, very, very, very few people get to go out there. I understand, there. that's what I understand, so I'm very fortunate. So, Steve, you think that's it for your prize? There's more? There is There's more. more. There's wow. more. Okay. Come with me. All right, let's go. Well, you know, you were really close to the track today. You were yes. so close on yes. both sides. Oh, oh my, Steve. no way! <laughs> <laughs>
Paul Tracy of the Forsyth Racing Team needs no introduction. He is going to take Steve out for the ride of his life in an official Grand Prix pace car. <laughs> no All right. way! Enjoy! This is Ford's supercar, the GT40. It's powered by a 5.4 liter supercharged V8 engine with 550 horsepower. The Ford GT40 is a streetcar, but with a top speed of 205 miles an hour, it has the performance to match or beat some of the best sports cars in the world. You did it. This is, this is the only one. Just the adrenaline is going to be too much. <laughs> no words. Let's go. miles an hour. Wow. Awesome, man. Thank you. That was cool. That was the best ride I've ever had in my life. The best bar none. I don't know how we can top that. Can I just stay in here for a while? <laughs> Thank you, guys. I can't believe it. I, don't, I just, just from collecting some cars that I got this. <laughs> so what did it feel like? Well, it was about 10 times faster than anything else I've ever been in before. I can't believe the pull. This thing just pulls and goes. It just keeps going. I mean, I don't know what else can top it. It's ride of a lifetime. What an incredibly exciting day on Collector Showdown. Steve came out on top, getting him the honorary pit crew member status for the day. And not just an honorary pit crew status member, but he was put to work. And then the pace car ride. What more could he ask for? Two military collectors will engage in a battle of wit, smarts, and skill for the chance of winning an exciting mystery prize today on Collector Showdown. So do you like my tank? <laughs> Your heart goes, oh, that's the one I want. I was so surprised when I saw it. And I am ready for battle. Oh, oh my God, everybody leave. <laughs> I'm completely flummoxed. Oh, yeah. This could be my finest hour. Let's go to it. We are here at the Ontario Regiment Museum whose claim to fame is that all of these historical military vehicles are fully operational. And it's on these grounds where our collectors of military artifacts will do battle for our secret prize. Thank you, Frank. On Collector Showdown, there are two challenges. First, a test of knowledge. Second, a test of skill. If our contestants are tied after the first two rounds, we go to a sudden death showdown. The stakes are high and the winner takes all. The prize will be a dream come true for only one of these two collectors. Will it be Martin, the dedicated collector of cat badges and medals? Or Sandy, who loves cavalry and tanks? You are just going to have to watch and find out. One of the most prolific hobbies is the collecting and researching of military artifacts and accoutrements. There's those that collect because they want a collection. There's those that collect because they want to preserve history. There are literally thousands of different collectibles related to the military forces of the world. So what items are collectors after? There's badges, medals, uniforms, radio equipment. Then you got those that like to collect and preserve weapons. The various groups that collect, preserve and operate historic military vehicles. Various souvenirs that can be brought back from foreign lands. There's a large following of German kit. And when you look at the auctions, for instance, uh, the price that the German stuff brings is really quite high. We have so much history. 
and people just don't know about it. Did you know that airport over there, the Oshawa Airport, was the dropping off point for the spy school back in World War II, Camp X? Hundreds of secret agents trained there, including the creator of James Bond, Ian Fleming. History's so cool, and it's not surprising our collectors think so too. My name is Martin Tripp, and I'm a collector of military. Badges, uniforms, medals, weapons. I have items from the Peninsula War right the way up until the end of the Second World War. My name is Sandy McCrory and I collect militaria, mainly anything to do with the Royal Tank Regiment and the preceding cavalry from about 1796 through to the mid-40s. I've been collecting uh, militaria since I was about six years of age and I was growing up during the war in England. I've always had an interest in tanks. Since I was a small child, my father took me to the Tank Museum in Bovington. I was about five or six years old. I just basically started off a collection of a few medals and a few hats and items that have been returned. Some of them were of the Allied forces and some were the Axis forces. Ever since then, I've been interested in tanks and military vehicles, specifically British and Commonwealth tanks. Next thing I knew, I was buying all this stuff and it seemed just to collect it. I uh, try to find things more of the unusual, something that's got a little bit of a story behind it, uh, something fairly unique if possible. This is probably my favorite medal. It's the Peninsula War Medal of 1810-1813, issued to senior British officers who commanded Portuguese troops. It is an extremely rare medal. I also collect cap badges. Uh, for example, this is all the British cavalry regiments of 1914. I like to have the complete set. You know, it's not to me complete unless you have every one of them. You'll be flicking through something and suddenly you see that one badge you want. So your heart goes, oh, that's the one I want, that's the one I want. You know, now I'll complete my collection. Yeah, I've always had an interest in history. I look around the room and you'll see the, the walls are lined with books. We have a saying in the collecting fraternity is the first thing you do is buy a book and then you buy another book, and then you buy another book. And after you have about half a dozen books, then you start collecting. This is probably my most favorite piece. This is a, a 1916 British tank visor. The early tanks, the, the, the armor was quite thin, so when a bullet hit the outside, it would cause flaking inside. As you can see, you put it over their face, it protected their eyes and protected their upper mouth. They are quite rare and I'm very fortunate to have one. This is something I literally rescued from possible disappearance forever. This telex is dated May the 7th, 1945, and it is a directive to the commanders of the Canadian forces to stand down, in other words, cease hostilities since a surrender had been arranged between the German army and the Allied forces. This particular item, I purchased a military policeman's, Canadian military policeman's battle dress. And this particular telex was actually folded up in the pocket of this thing. And I, was, I was so surprised when I saw it. I also collect swords. I have approximately 19 of them, and they're all basically cavalry swords. One in my hand is a 1853. This is the sword which had been carried at the Charge of the Light Brigade and in the Crimean Wars. It's one of my favorites, actually. This one's actually the 10th Hussars. As you can see, I collect hats and helmets, really anything from the First and the Second World War. The first collectible I bought was actually this pickle hat. This is the helmet the Germans wore. It's a, a dress helmet. Now, this particular hat was actually the property of Prince Oscar, who was the crown prince of the royal family of Germany. This is the German steel helmet. It's probably one of the most recognizable pieces of military in the world. Kind of like Schultz almost from Hogan's Heroes. But uh, as you can see, when you were crouched down in the trenches, this would protect your head plus your shoulders. And this is the famous Canadian helmet that was worn on the D-Day invasion, June 6, 1944. I think basically I'm just a collector. If I wasn't collecting this, I'd be collecting something else. My main interest is ensuring that these things are preserved for other people to see them in the future. And to my challenger, I say, let the best man win. Let's go to it. Looking forward to meeting you, Martin, and this could be my finest hour. This is the first time our contestants actually get to meet each other face to face. Sandy, Martin, Martin, Sandy. How are you? Martin, and I'm ready for battle. Oh, oh my God, everybody leave. <laughs> this is going to be fun. <laughs> Round one is a test of knowledge. I will ask each contestant nine questions relating to the world of militaria. Whoever gets the most right wins round one. 
what or who was one of the most important tanks from World War II, the M4 Sherman, named after? What or who? Martin, what is your answer? U.S. General in the Civil War. Do you have the name of the U.S. General? General Sherman. And Sandy, what is your answer? General Sherman. General Sherman. Yep. And the answer mm -hmm. is General William Tecumseh Sherman. The World War II M4 Sherman tank is named after the famous U.S. General William T. Sherman, whose ruthless military campaigns helped end the American Civil War. So you both got this one right. You're tied 1-1 one, one on question number one. What is the highest price paid for a Victoria Cross? You can answer in British pounds, which is the currency it was sold for back in 2004, or American dollars. If you get the correct answer within 10% of the selling price, you get this one right. Martin, what is your answer? $225,000 US. And Sandy, what is your answer? I said 750,000 pounds. And the actual answer is 235,250 British pounds, which translates into $433,683 back in April 2004. This Victoria Cross was awarded during World War II to Sergeant Norman Jackson of the British Royal Air Force. So you're tied, still 1-1. One, one. What were the handles on the famous U.S. General George S. Patton Jr.'s pistols made of? Martin, tell me your answer. Pearl handle pistols. Sandy? Pearl handle pistols. Well, I have to tell you, you both got this answer wrong. Oh, wrong. The answer is ivory, but U.S. General George S. Patton did say that the only person who would carry a pearl-handled pistol is most likely a pimp in a New Orleans bordello. Oh, so dear. He wasn't that far off at himself. Gosh, you know, okay? all right. <laughs> now, you're still tied, 1-1. One, one. We are moving on to question number four. What were factory workers in World War I led to believe they were building when, in fact, they were building battle tanks? Martin, what's your answer? Water tanks. Sandy? And water tanks. That's where the name comes from. And the answer is water tanks. You both got this one right. People who were building these things in British factories were given the impression that they were building tracked water tanks when in fact they were building battle tanks. So that's how they were keeping it top secret. So you're tied now, two, two. What was the name of the organization that monitored the manufacturing of badges, decorations, uniforms, and other Nazi party items? And I'm just looking for the abbreviation here. Martin, what is your answer? I think it's guess, guess. Sandy, what do you say? I haven't got a clue, so I guessed the National Socialist Badge Makers. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> That's a great guess, both of you, but you both got this one wrong. Oh, so we're still It tied. was the RZM. Oh, they no. were the quality control office for the Nazi party, and anyone making anything for the Nazi party had to apply for a RZM number, which was then stamped onto all of the items. So you're ah. still tied 2-2. Two, two. Name the British commando's fighting knife from World War II. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Martin, tell me what your answer is. Fairburn Sykes 
Sandy, what do you think it is? I've got Sykes Fairburn. And you both got it right. It was either or Fairburn Sykes or Sykes Fairburn. And it was the dagger that became the symbol of the British commandos in World War II. And it was designed based on Shanghai street daggers with its stiletto style razor sharp double edge blade. So we're both tied 3-3. Three, three. There are three questions left. So either of you could still have a chance to get a leg up here. That's getting tense now. <laughs> a leg up or a leg over? <laughs> a leg up here. All right, question number seven. I was, was going to say that, but I thought I'd better not. <laughs> what nation handed out the most expensive military decoration? Martin, what do you say? USSR. Sandy, what did you I do? said the UK, United Kingdom. And the actual answer is the Soviet Union. Yeah. Oh, they Lord. had the Order of Victory, which had 135 diamonds on a two inch platinum star. 135 diamonds. So, Martin, you are ahead. Four. Sorry about that. Sandy, no, three. Hey, hey, whoa. <laughs> Gotta get to pull some out of the bag here, I think. When was the last British service cavalry sword issued? First issued. Okay, Martin, tell me what your answer is. I have the 1930s. 1930s? Right. Sandy, I want to know what your answer is. The last patent was in 1908. 1908, and it was 1908. It was the Pattern Cavalry Trooper's Sword. It was the last service sword issued to the cavalry of the British Army. So, you have tied now. 4-4. Four, four. And this is the last question. Either one of you, if you get this one right, you win round one of Collector Showdown. And if you both get it right, then we go on to round two and winner takes all. Which battle in World War I featured the first successful use of tanks ever? And the key word here is successful. Do you want the location? Well, if you say the name of the town, that is the name of the battle, so that would work. Martin, what is your answer? Cambrai. Sandy? November 1917, the Battle of Cambrai. And the actual answer here is the Battle of Cambrai. That was the first successful use of tanks. That's when they were able to break the German deadlock trench lines. Uh, there were a couple of other forays into the trenches with tanks before that, but neither were really deemed successful. You guys are both tied after round one. So do you know what that means? Well, we get to stand in front of the cannon while they fire? <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> that means that in round two of Collector Showdown, and whoever wins gets to claim our fabulous mystery prize. Ah, crikey. Are you guys all set for round two? Certainly are. Well, let's get a move on. That's it. Round two of Collector Showdown next. I am sending you both on a mission. I'm completely flummoxed. Hope somebody can pay the cleaning bill. After the test of knowledge in round one of Collector Showdown, military collectors Sandy and Martin are tied. That means whoever wins round two gets to claim our mystery prize. For this next competition, we are taking full advantage of this unique military museum. Well, here we are at the uh, Ontario Regiment Museum. The whole flavor of the museum is the preservation and presentation of Canadian military history. Unlike what you see in most museums, our collection is actually operational. We have about 50 vehicles that we can pretty well just jump into and start up and drive. Everything from the Second World War right through until the Gulf War. There's museums with big collections, a lot bigger than ours, but if we've got it, we can drive it. So, you guys both tied after the first round, so this is round two. Whoever wins this round takes the game, wins Collector Showdown, and gets to claim our fabulous mystery prize. So a gentlemanly battle. Do you guys have anything you want to say to each other? Well, may the oh. best man win. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. Here's what's going to happen. I am sending you both 
on a mission. In my hand, I have two cards, one for each of you, and on each of those cards is a clue that will lead you to one of the many historic vehicles in this hangar. And once you find that vehicle, there will be another clue that will lead you to another vehicle, and so on. Whoever finishes first wins. I'm gonna give you each your cards. Don't look at them until I say so. And then we will start the race. So hold those close to your chest. All right, gentlemen. Are you ready? Oh, yeah, I'm ready. Are ready. you set? I'm ready, set. ready, ready, go. <laughs> Excellent, go. For the first clue, Martin is looking for an armored scout vehicle that has four wheels and an all welded steel body. It is named after a small weasel like animal. Sandy is looking for a United Nations cargo vehicle whose passenger seat folds up, allowing the co pilot to stand and operate a machine gun. I'm looking for a muffler screen. How about that? No, not the water bottle. I guess I'm in the wrong vehicle. Then. Well, this is a driver's seat, and I can't see anything underneath there. Ah. Next, you must find a quarter ton vehicle that was used in World War II and was nicknamed a Peep due to its small size and ability to sneak into enemy territory. Look in the glove compartment. Let's see if there's any other United Nations vehicles. That's, a, that's actually a Jeep. So. No, that can't be a cargo vehicle. I'm completely flummoxed. <laughs> but, uh... Ah, ah! The third item you must find is a V-12 aircraft engine that was originally built for use in an Avro Lancaster airplane, but was instead used in a tank for extra horsepower. Check the exhaust manifold. Engine, I saw an engine. It's over the back here somewhere. Ah, oh, oh, I see. Yes, indeed. There's juice and a half across here. And the driver's seat is over here. I think we'll probably find something here. Ah, under the driver's seat. Ah, here we are. OK, the next vehicle you must find is a lightly armoured vehicle which was commonly nicknamed the Bren Gun Carrier. Check behind the fuel container. Ah, the fuel container is in here we go, behind the fuel container. Now I'm getting stuck right here. The third vehicle you must find is a 1942 truck, which was available as a personnel carrier, an ambulance, and as a means of sending out wireless messages. Check in the battery box. Okay. Ah. <laughs> Next, find the armored track vehicle from 1942 with its two Cadillac V8 engines with automatic transmissions. This vehicle was built to replace the problematic M5A1 light tank in World War II. Once there, immediately locate a collector showdown car for further instruction. Hmm, light tank, that's, it's gotta be this one. This is a CMP, Canadian military pattern. Am I looking at something here? Ah, battery box, here we go, that's all. Okay, next find the armoured track vehicle in 1942 at two Cadillac V8. Hidden somewhere in on or around this vehicle is a World War II artifact. First collector to find it puts it, and puts it on wins. Oh, that's it. So it's something to wear. Ah, there we go. In the back here. There's something in here. If I can get it. Hope somebody's gonna pay the cleaning bill. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. And he makes it in there. Oh. Way. Oh. Son of a gun. Oh. I think you should put that on. <laughs> Definitely. Congratulations, Martin. You won Collector Showdown and get to claim our hey. fabulous mystery prize. I got a helmet. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Sandy, yeah. now you didn't win. 
How do you feel? No. Are you, gonna, are you all right? Uh, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty uh, heartbroken, but what can I do? Well, I, the, the better man won, that's all I can say, you know. Is there anything you would have done differently? <laughs> well, I did get confused on the Jeep. That's my, my main thing. I lost. Uh, I thought the Jeep was a two and a half tonner, so it's my own fault. So you win some, you lose some. And uh, well, you know, maybe next time. Maybe next time. Maybe You're next a great time. sport. Thank you. Thank you. For playing. So, Martin, do you want to know what you won, what your fabulous mystery prize is? Leave me to him. Well, here's a hint. You're well equipped. Come on. Okay. <laughs> I'll take you to it. Martin, do you have any idea what you won? No, absolutely not at all. None at all? None whatsoever, no. Honestly. Lieutenant no. Frank Moore, come on in. He's going to tell hey, you. Hey, Frank. <laughs> Martin, well, congratulations. I understand you won something here that involves some of what we have around the, uh, the museum today. What uh, is it? How about a ride in one of the biggest, ugliest SUVs, our 1944 Sherman tank? Hey, sounds great. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh, and by the way, oh, you, you'll need this. Got... I, mean, I, I gotta be the loader too. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> That's the 76 millimeter cartridge for the main gun. Fire it. I don't know. Are we, we going to fire it? Not my job. <laughs> I'm the driver. <laughs> I, I'm the loader. Uh, <laughs> Guess what? We don't have a gunner. You're it. Okay. Who are we going to aim it at? Anybody particular? <laughs> oh, well. Are any politicians either. around? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Martin? Yeah? So what do you think? This is I don't know. Very cool <laughs> it's, a, it's pretty cool. So I think that you guys should just go on ahead. Yep. Okay. It's time. Sure. Okay. All right. I'll bring that with you. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yep. All set? Very good. Okay, don't drop that. We'll see. I think I'll rear view mirrors, I just realized. <laughs> Ready to back up. Oh, hey, back up beeps. Yeah. Now you're ready for your next job. <laughs> okay, gonna right. Hold. Here's how we load a Sherman. 76 millimeter. You just have to push this way over there. Breach is now open. There's our blank charge. This is in there. Run up the spout. Now, in order to fire, you gotta climb down in again. Martin, are you ready to fire? I'm ready to fire. Ready to fire? I'll give you a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. Give it a good whack. <laughs> oh, that was it. <laughs> oh, you made a mess, Martin. <laughs> All the seagulls just pooped. <laughs> Get a bang out of that? Yeah, no, I, I wish I'd be, uh, hit it right the first time. <laughs> yeah. right? Oh. oh, it takes quite a little whack. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Old mechanical things, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>